It is likely that the Hazaras will continue to have grounds in the UK under the 1951 Refugee Convention to Fair Persecution. After the ruling Pashtuns and the Tajiks, Hazaras are the third largest ethnic group in Afghanistan. The Hazaras traditionally live in Hazarajat, a loosely defined territory in the central highlands. While about 85% of Afghanistan's population follow Salafi Islam, most Hazaras are Shiite Muslims, causing them to be condemned as infidels at different points throughout history. Their suffering began in earnest in the late 1800s. Hazaras were slain, raped, sold into slavery, and soldiers piled Hazaras' heads into towers to warn against others against dissent. To depopulate the Hazara Jab, the government issued firm and royal decrees authorizing Pashtun nomads known as Kuchis to access Hazara's land for grazing their livestock. Victorious Rahad Rahman claimed that the Afghanis saw Hazaras as enemies of their country and religion, laying the foundations of the Hazara's current for persecution. Significantly, this established a pattern in which successive governments marginalized Hazaras for much of the 20th century. They have been deprived of their basic rights and vital infrastructure in their villages and taxed indiscriminately. Persecution intensified under the Taliban regime. In 1998, the Taliban slaughtered approximately 2,000 Hazaras in Mazar Sharif. Civilians were killed in residential areas and marketplaces, some drying from having their throats slit. The Taliban governor, Mullah Manoon Niazi, had publicly incited the attack, preaching Hazaras are not Muslim, you can kill them. It is not a sin. Highlighting the driving ethnic and religious nature of the attack, Hazaras were reportedly warned to take lessons from their own history and to either convert, flee, or to be killed. Hundreds fled the terror of Mazar Sharif. Massacre continued with Taliban soldiers rounding up civilians in Yakodonk district in 2001 publicly executing at least 170, many of whom were Hazaras. Near Robatat Pass, the Taliban also executed 31 civilians, with 26 confirmed to be Hazaras. Turning now to Pakistan, the Hazaras in Balochistan, particularly Quetta, have been targeted for over a decade now. The patriotic Hazara community has contributed many of its sons to the Pakistan army. The extremists have decided to target Hazara community as a way of retaliating against Pakistan army. Anti-state elements are doing this in the name of religion and ethnicity, trying to create an Afghan-style scenario in Pakistan. The situation has worsened over time and police cadets, government officials, vegetable vendors and laborers have been killed. This includes the murder of an internationally renowned boxer who represented Pakistan in the Olympics three times and won several medals. However, for his killers, the only thing that defined him was the fact that he was a member of the Shia Hazara community. Only, one day, uh, only 21 days after the brutal Mustang massacre, fresh attacks have taken place where rockets were fired at a bus carrying pilgrims, including women and children. These murderous attacks have now become so frequent that they no longer qualify as news in the international media or the national media. The onslaught of targeted killing continues, unabated with half a dozen more from the Hazara tribe injured just last night. The aim of the conference this year is to reflect on the plight of Shia Hazara and their future as a minority community in the context of their right to religious freedom, citizenship, and more importantly, life without fear. The, this program will consist of presentations and panel discussions that will feature leading figures from academia, civil society, and human rights. To convert, flee, or to be killed, it shouldn't be an option for any community. The denial of fundamental rights to be able to live without fear is one of the biggest human rights issues of today. The peaceful Hazaras are self-starters who play a full role in the society and many feel their achievements are outstanding. Today, on behalf of International Imam Hussein Council and notables from the Hazara community, I demand extension of the Political Parties Act specifically to the Hazara community. Hazara-dominated areas 
to empower them to elect their representatives for Senate and National Assembly in the same way as the former Prime Minister Shaheed Mutarma Benazir Bhutto extended it in the Fatah areas. We need to see more Hazaras in the top levels of the society. As British citizens, and by the way, when I, when I say that we would like this Political Parties Act to be extended, what I mean specifically is the Hazara community who are being targeted because of their distinct ethnicity and their features. Uh, at this crucial moment in your history, uh, when, as we've heard from several of the speakers, the Hazaras are under tremendous pressure, particularly in Quetta, but elsewhere in the world as well. Um, the Imam Hussein Council circulated a note reminding us before this meeting began that uh, Hazaras had, in Afghanistan had suffered persecution at the hands of the Pushtun majority there since the mid-18th mid century um, and that in the 1850s uh, the Emir Abdul Rahman Khan attacked the Hazarajat, brought the southern part of the territory under his direct control and organized the Sunni Hazaras to assist him in subjugating the Shias. He imposed heavy taxes on them, appointed Pashtun administrators to control the territory and confiscated the best lands which he then gave to Pashtun nomads as we've already heard. It was estimated that 60% of the Hazara population was massacred or displaced by this and the later campaigns by Abdul Rahman and some 35,000 families were compelled to flee and settled in Mashhad in Iran, in Quetta uh, and even to parts of Central Asia. But sadly they didn't escape from persecution in their new homes and today we're witnessing this fresh wave of killings that you've heard about this afternoon and the threat of wholesale massacres in uh, Afghanistan if Sunni extremists take over when the Americans withdraw. You know that the Taliban murdered several thousand Hazaras after they captured Mazar-e-Sharif in 1998 and Mullah Niazi, who was the main criminal responsible for that crime against humanity, who became governor of the region when it was controlled by the Taliban, denounced the Hazaras as infidels and threatened to kill them if they held to their religious beliefs, as we've already heard. Thousands sought, sought asylum in Iran, where at least their lives were safe, but they still live in constant fear of refoulement to, Afghani to Afghanistan. And thousands more became refugees all over the world today, and there are significant Hazara communities in the US, in Northern Europe, in the UK here, and in Australia, funnily enough, which has the third largest uh, population in the diaspora after Iran and Pakistan. Now I want to focus in the next few minutes particularly on the situation in Pakistan, where the Hazara are having a especially hard time in common with other religious minorities. And one has to say that Pakistan is on the way to earning the title of failed state, in the sense that killings and maimings of religious minorities generally and attacks on their places of worship are escalating year on year and it's extremely rare as we've heard for the perpetrators to be arrested let alone to be convicted and within the last two months there have been three separate multiple murders of Hazaras in and near Quetta. On September the 20th uh, there was an armed attack on a bus full of Hazara pilgrims travelling uh, through Mastung near Quetta and at least uh, 26 people were dead uh, Lashkfar Lashkfa, Lashkfa a Jangbi we've already heard mentioned a militant group designated as terrorist organization by Pakistan and the US claimed responsibility for this attack and then three days later uh, unidentified gunmen who we suppose also belong to the same organization opened fire on a van carrying Hazara passengers killing three of them um, and then on October the 4th 13 people were killed this time when unidentified gunmen stopped a bus carrying Hazara passengers on their way to work and you have to ask how is it that Pakistan has descended into this appalling condition 
with terrorists attacking people belonging to religious minorities with impunity in broad daylight. The newspaper Dawn, reporting on the latest atrocity, thought it was the ties between the various militant groups all over the country that made their operations possible. It was the Lashkar i Jangvi of southern Punjab that was supposed to be responsible for most of the killings, having developed uh, links with the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And their terrorists found it convenient to operate in and around Quetta, retreating into seminaries and other safe havens in nearby lawless border areas between attacks. That was the theory of the, of the Dawn newspaper. Uh, the sectarian Jundullah group is also suspected to have had a hand in anti-Shia violence in Baluchistan, despite its focus on Iran. The situation was thus a prime example of fallout from increasing collaboration amongst militant groups in different areas of Pakistan, the paper considered, and they called for much better protection to be afforded to the Hazara, as well as a commitment to tackle both the militants themselves who are targeting Shias, as well as those who have allowed them to operate with such impunity in that part of Baluchistan. But should we not be relating these tragic events in Baluchistan to the wider context of attacks on Shia elsewhere in, in Pakistan, as Dr. Ali Halawi has, has said, uh, and, and in other parts of the world? Um, in December 2009, a bomb attack on the Ashura procession in Karachi killed at least 33 people and injured dozens more. And then in September 2010, there were three bombs detonated against a Shia procession in Lahore, killing at least 20 people and injuring 170. And so I wonder if atrocities like these, similar violence against other minorities, could be happening without the passive compliance, at least, of the security forces and the ideological backing of a section of the Pakistani population which is imbued with religiously sanctioned hatred against anybody who doesn't subscribe to their particular brand of Islam. Yesterday, Imran Khan said that he, he's elected as Prime Minister, he will take control of the ISI and the army, which have always been a separate power in the land. And the US has called on Pakistan intelligence to cut its ties to the Haqqani network which attacked the US Embassy in Kabul and many other targets and to shut down the safe havens on the Afghan-Pakistan frontier. But the official response from Islamabad was to warn the US that they were risking the loss of an ally with this kind of talk. Afghan officials have also pitched in, accusing the ISI of having a part in the killing of Burhanuddin Rabani, a former Afghan president who was to have led the negotiations with the uh, Taliban. And I think there can be no doubt uh, that the ISI is out of control and has acted for a long time against the interests of the vast majority of the Pakistani people. But possibly there's an even greater danger to the stability and safety of Pakistan, which comes from the Salafist ideology which is being promoted in mosques and madrasas financed by Saudi money, estimated at no less than $100 million a year throughout the country. This ideology is exclusivist and intolerant, maintaining that all who don't subscribe to their version of Islam are infidels, belonging to the Dar al Hab, the realm of the unbeliever. In its extreme form, it promotes sectarian and religious hatred and teaches, as we've heard, that killing the unbelievers is an act approved by God, although nothing is to be found in the Holy Quran to support this monstrous idea. Now, it must be a huge temptation to poor families who want to see their sons educated and to have the prospects of a good career to accept the offer of a cash grant, said to be around $6,500 per child, to send them to these free madrasas with the promise of a career in the service of Islam. But others have suggested that the problem rests equally on the abysmal quality of state education and the high dropout rates, which mean that the population generally is illiterate and vulnerable to extremist propaganda. And the only effective way to compete with this system would be a well-funded network of state schools offering a broad-based education in useful subjects, <coughs> including the sciences, maths, IT, foreign languages and history, and, and based 
uh, soundly uh, on the principles of freedom, the rule of law and democracy. I believe that we should consider how we can best promote um, the, the, these principles in Pakistani education so that all can have a fair chance of earning a living without being sucked into sectarian violence. But to come back now to the position of the Hazaras and what can be done, we've heard from several speakers how you must mobilise and you must make use of all the possibilities of uh, enlisting the support of organisations such as the Foreign Office and the United Nations in the battle for survival of the Hazara people. I suggest that, first of all, you collect together the information, some of which has been handed to me this afternoon, on what's happened to the Hazara in Quetta particularly, but in the rest of Pakistan and in uh, other parts of the world, so that this dossier can be presented to the Foreign Office, to the United Nations, the Special Rapporteur on Religious Freedom, and that we can call their attention to the things that we've been discussing this afternoon and get the support of the international community, which is absolutely essential if the Hazaras are to be rescued from the appalling atrocities in, with which they've been inflicted in the last few years. I believe you can do this, that the Hazara community has the political will, has the resources to collect this information together to make a case towards the Foreign Office. We've already been in touch with them, as you probably know, and we have had a, encouraging noises from the Foreign Office who say they're conscious of the plight of the Hazara community, that they do draw this to the attention of the Pakistani authorities when they speak to them. But we want a slightly more robust attitude to come from both the Foreign Office and from the European Union. Um, we want a, a, them to take up with Pakistan um, the need to tackle extremism and hatred at its roots, to promote tolerance, as we hope will happen uh, in the Pakistani elections, which are not so distant, in 2013. So let's all get together, as we've heard already, mobilise the Hazara community in, in approaching the international community and ensuring that these things are drawn to the attention of the world and that they know about the plight of the Hazara community and are determined to assist you in rescuing them from their plight. Thank you, Sister Rabab, for organising this meeting, and I'm with you in great solidarity in your future campaigns. The, the targeting is to you as a community, the targeting is also at a broader level to the general mass of the Shia, and there's targeting also against moderate Sunnis. So we must understand that this is not just a, a special focus uh, on a certain group that is victimized. But you obviously have to take care of yourselves first. Charity starts at home. And I really urge you to, to see what are the resources that you have at your disposal to break into the international arena where your voice can be heard. Your voice must reach uh, international institutions, your voice must reach the United Nations Human Rights uh, Organization, your voice must reach the international groups such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, all other NGOs concerned with, uh, uh, with human rights and the plight of refugees, all other groups that are concerned with minority rights. In this country, I believe there's a group called the Minority Rights Groups. Nobody wants to think of themselves as a minority. It's not very attractive to go through life thinking of yourself as a minority. What we all strive to be is to have rights that are equal between us and other, mem and other members of the community, that we're not discriminated against because we are white or black, because we have uh, long hair or no hair, or because we have this or those uh, particular features. What we want are rights that are due to us as human beings, that are enshrined in the ethics of Islam, and that are part and parcel of the uh, contract, the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has with human beings. These rights are not something that we just give away or that are special to a certain groups. They are available to all human beings. And this is what the ayah says that, that Allah has graced Bani Adam. 
So do not give up on your rights. Do not think of yourself as victims. You are already, you already have succeeded because you are here, because you have taken up the cause that is yours by right. And I'm sure if you, if you ask properly, you shall, be, you shall receive the assistance. And I shall be the first one who, to sign up for the cause of ensuring the rights of the Hazaras in Pakistan and their rights as citizens. You are citizens of that country. You don't have to apologize to anyone for being there. This is something that is, that is your political right. You, you must not think of yourself as a community that needs special protection. Nobody needs special protection in a, in a, in a society based on laws, on a society based on order. Of course, Pakistan, like any other country in that part of the world, even sometimes uh, in the Western world, I mean, where were human rights during the riots uh, of a few months ago here? Where were the human rights in the United States during the black civil rights struggle? These things require struggle, require commitment, require con uh, require continuity, require solidarity, require understanding of the landscape of the uh, political and human rights organizations. So organize yourselves, be proud of who you are, demand your rights as citizens, exert your rights politically, and for those who are trying to persecute you and to divide you and to kill you, you have to mobilize yourselves. Mobilize yourselves with a pen. Mobilize yourselves by what is good. Mo mobilize yourselves by the strength and the power of your case. So I, I stand here as a, as a person who has gone through similar experiences, not exactly the same, but similar experiences, who can empathize with you. And I can assure you that the work that has been suggested is the work that you should under, undertake. And you, you will have the support, I think, of like-minded men and women in order to, to achieve uh, your rights, your human rights and your political rights as a community. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, my lord everything, that the, what other means of the pressure can the UK government build up on the Pakistani government to uh, stop this genocide that's going on, apart from making a dossier and submitting to the European Parliament and in the UK? Thank you. I think you have to be um, realistic about it and say that the powers of the UK government to compel the Pakistan government to do the things that we want them to do, to take positive and robust action against terrorism and anarchy, um, that these are, these are things beyond the powers of either the UK or the European Union. I mean, you may, you may think that because Pakistan is the recipient of large amounts of aid, that there could be some pressure to be brought on, on those fronts. But what you do, and you, you take away the aid, you're, you're not punishing the leaders of Pakistan, you're punishing the people who are the recipients, of, of the, of the beneficiaries of that aid. And so we've never wanted to use aid as a mechanism for attempting to persuade other governments, Pakistan in particular, in this context, to comply with the principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And it can only be done by persuasion, but perhaps the persuasion has not been sufficiently robust in the past, and that uh, along the lines that I've suggested earlier on, that we put together this dossier about the Hazaras, we submit it to the Foreign Office and to the European Union, and to the Rapporteur on uh, Religious Freedom, we might get them to pay greater attention, because when you look at the for example, the Foreign Office's report on human rights. Yes, there is a sector on Pakistan. It's one of the 26 countries of, uh, which uh, seem to be most in need of the human rights attention of the Foreign Office and of those who are interested in human rights. But there's nothing at all in there about the Hazaras. So I mean, let's get, try and get the Hazaras a little bit notched up in, in the priorities of the Foreign Office and to use them as an example of what needs to be done. But I come back to what I was saying at the end, that we need to tackle the ideologies on which this <coughs> terrorism and uh, hatred is based. Why do people want to commit these atrocities? Uh, why do they voluntarily take uh, suicide vests and go and blow themselves up, killing innocent women and children? It's because of the ideological basis 
which they're taught in some of the Saudi madrasas in Pakistan, I believe, uh, which causes them to do things which are so foreign to Islam and so foreign to civilization. Can I just say, I mean, the reality of the world, unfortunately, is that if you don't have, if you don't know how to speak the UN language, if you don't know how to write your document, your human rights abuses, if you don't have oil, if you don't have power, nobody really cares. Maybe apart from Lord Avery and a few others who have this human touch in the politics. But the reality of the grounds, the big players do not care. Now, really and truly, you are not even on the reports of human rights abuses. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows what's happened to you. And everything is done step by step. Mm -hmm. I think unless you begin to feature on the great scheme of things about human rights abuses, nobody will even think about intervention because of you. <coughs> unless there is real life, the media is involved. I mean, if you just look at the Bahrain experience, Sometimes one story can make the headlines and can change the world. That girl which was on the independent front page is now being awarded a prize in South Africa. So it's the whole, it's like a ripple effect. The whole issue 